Hi everybody, hope you're doing marvelously well. Today we're at Spitfire Studio, as per usual. Here it is, here's Spitfire Studio. Look, Christian, say hello. Hello. It is approximately 100 billion degrees out here. It is so unbelievably hot. But we're gonna go in and we're gonna try out my favorite plugins. So stay tuned for an episode on my favorite plugins. Hi everybody, hope you're doing marvelously well. In this episode, we're going to talk about, well, my favorite plugins, ones that I use all the time, and have a little bit of a discussion about plugins themselves. There are, of course, two distinct different types of plugins. There's the native ones, which is what we're going to be doing here, because as you can see, we're back in the home studio build. So this is my kid's old bedroom that we turned into a, into a studio. And we're running the new Mac Studio, the M1 Studio, and uh, everything is native. But my other studio, which is behind the house, is an HDX system. And that has a separate card-based system. A little bit like, of course, UAD. Because UAD also have cards that can go into the computer or are on the device itself. That is known as a DSP system. And that is a digital signal processor, I believe. My memory serves me well. And they were very, very popular when I first started. In the mid, late 90s, that was pretty much the only way to go. And it was because computers were sophisticated-ish, but they weren't that powerful to run all of that digital signal processing. So you would have what was commonly known as a card-based system. I remember buying like G3s and G4s. In fact, my first computer was a 7600, I think. We're talking like very old. And I think it had six slots, six PCI slots. And we put those slots in there and all of the processing was done on those cards, not internally in the computer. But now we're in a world where you've got like this M1 and you've got PCs that, you know, people build for a fraction of the cost that are super powerful and you can run everything natively. And in the studio, we are running everything natively, except for the fact that we have a universal audio Apollo twin. So there is some digital signal processing power that comes with that unit. But UAD, of course, also have Spark, which is native as well. So we are, of course, going to be concentrating on native plugins because most of you with home studios like this are going to be living in that world. And frankly, I've got some very, very good friends that are mixing huge albums and it's all done natively. Even people I know tracking now are running native systems. We are going to upgrade the studio with ESSL and we're going to go into a hybrid system which is pretty remarkable where they're leaning a lot heavier on the computer because let's be honest, the computers are so unbelievably powerful now. Whether it be a Mac or a PC, you can really max out your computer and just do all kinds of crazy things that I couldn't do when I got started. When I got started, it was all about DSP. It was all about separate processing. All right, without further ado, let's get stuck in and start talking about some of my favorite plugins. And if you've been following um, us for now, the last seven or eight years that we've been doing this, I think we're about to come up to eight years. Jesus, Mary and Joseph. Um, you'll know that there are a handful of plugins that I use every single time. So this is gonna be a combination of the plugins I've been using for years, which are phenomenal, mixed in with a handful of newer plugins that I am using on a daily basis. So it's kind of a combo platter. And we can talk a little bit more about the manufacturers themselves as well, about other plugins that they have. All right, so let's go through a bunch of plugins that I love. I'm gonna go here to Sweetwater. Um, you can individually buy these plugins from all different sites and all kinds of stuff, but I'm gonna go to one place where I'm gonna shop for everything in one place. And of course, our very good friends at Sweetwater, as you know, Mike Arango, 15, I think it's come out 16 years ago, was my engineer. And we made a lot of great records together. He came in as an intern and a runner and assistant and very quickly became a full-time engineer in my own studio and recorded a lot of great things on his own. So I have a lot of respect for him. He also has a killer studio in his house, like ridiculously good studio. 
So obviously one of the advantages of buying from Sweetwater is that you can immediately activate the plugin and they have their own in-house technical team. One thing I like about Sweetwater is if you've ever been there, the companies have their own representatives inside that huge building. So it's pretty awesome that you know they have representation there at every company they work with, pretty much every company they work with. All right, so let's start. I'm looking at my list here. So we're gonna start with the Waves R-Base. I've often said to people, you could give me any stock plugins. Uh, you could open up any DAW and any of the stock plugins. I don't care what the DAW is, and I could probably do 95% of the mix using it. Sometimes there's not good limiters, but typically I'm probably able to do most of the mixing. The two plugins that I could just complete with anything are, firstly, this is the first one, which is R Bass. R Bass can be used for bass guitar, it can be used for toms, it's great on toms, and I've seen people use it on a kick drum, on a bass drum as well. I typically will use it on a tom if there's absolutely no low end in the tom, but on bass guitar it is superb. And I also like the fact that it defaults to 80. So if I go to a session here, here we have the R bass, and I am going to bypass it a second, and play this section. Let's put it in. Let's just take these first few notes here and listen to the low end with it in bypass. Now to put it in, I've got an intensity control here and it's defaulted to 80 hertz, which is a wonderful frequency for bass guitar. Bypass in the middle. So it is absolutely gorgeous. It's just rounding it out in that 80 area. And, and I love it on bass. Now, the second plugin that I always use, the Waves MV2, is one of just a couple of plugins I could never live without. Here it is, the Waves MV2. Ooh, look at that. Now, I'll give you a quick demo of how it works in a second, but just look at it here. First of all, it's always on sale. <laughs> it's $29, 30 bucks. It's 30 bucks. This low level over here on the left and high level on the right is just genius for bass guitars. It is on every single one of my bass guitar mixes. It doesn't matter if it's reggae, funk, metal, rock, pop. I don't care what the genre is. It is absolutely incredible on live bass guitars. Even the best bass players I've worked with can have dead spots on their vintage, you know, 1950 whatever bass, and you get real low level signal. Even if they're so beautifully, you know, the amazing players are really even performance, you'll still get notes that are printing quietly and others that are really boomingly loud. The low level here on the left allows you to bring up those quiet notes, and the high level on the right allows those high notes, those high level notes to be pushed back in. So what you might have is this huge dynamic range. The low stuff comes up, the high level stuff comes down, and suddenly you've got a far more controlled sound. It saves me using multiple compressors and EQs and limiters and all kinds of great, crazy stuff. I always put it at the end of my chain and it is phenomenal. I'll give you a quick demo. So here's the MV2. Now, you'll notice some of the low notes were getting a little boomy. And what you used to do on a console is literally just do a lot of automation. So you'd listen down and you'd, you'd push up notes that were kind of quiet, you'd roll them up, and then the ones that were too loud, you'd just bring down and you'd do a lot of fader moves. Well, the MV2 is just miraculous. So the low level here, we can take kind of anything quiet-ish, Take the high level stuff. 
our game match it here. Off. Big boomy note. Now with the MV2 on. It's, it's not turning it into a keyboard bass or anything like that, but it's taking an organic recorded live bass and evening out everything. Now I could find far more ridiculous uh, parts. In fact, we can manipulate it. We could pretend. Why don't we do that? Why don't we pretend? This is what I'm going to do. I'm going to go in here and I am going to clip gain down. So I'm going to pretend that this is one of the worst recorded bass guitar parts ever. Gain this down just to see what miracles you can do. So, you know, when you get those bass parts where the notes like dropping out or he goes up high and there's no low end anymore and it goes down super low and it just farts out, plays it too hard, hits the fretboard. Well, that's where the R bass and the MV2 can come in. So in bypass, this is what we have. Really dynamic. We could make it even more dynamic. Now, obviously, clip gain is me manipulating it, but you understand the principle, a really low recorded bass performance. So every other note could be like this. You could you'd be like, what am I going to do? Well, let's bring this back in. The low level. Bypass. See how dynamic that is? MV2 on. All low level. You'd never know. So it's kind of a miracle worker. If you put that across an overly dynamic bass line, you can find that happy medium where you want to keep some of the dynamics. But what I love about using this in conjunction with the R bass in particular, is like if, when the bass player goes really super high and all the low end is disappearing, the R bass brings it back in. It just generates consistent low end. And then the MV2 just rounds everything up and controls it. It's an absolutely superb combination on bass guitar. We have the Produce Like a Pro Academy and so many people have learned this trick and they come in and their low end is all over the place and they can't get their, their kick drum and their bass guitar to work together. And then they learn some of these tricks and before you know it, they're making stuff that sounds like records. And it really does sort out the men from the boys, the girls from the women, it really does sort it out. If you get good controlled low end, it makes your albums, your mixes sound super professional. So another consistent oldie but goldie, if, of course, is the analog channel. It's the Mac DSP analog channel. Now, if you've watched any of our videos and you've seen the people I've interviewed over the years, you'll know that Colin McDowell is like held in so much high regard by all of us in the industry. He was one, he may have been the first, one of the first people to actually create third party plugins. He worked at Avid in the early days and then left and started his own company. And the analog channel is just a superb plugin. It really is. And it can be a make it or break it. You can take really super digitally recorded stuff and just make it feel like maybe it hit some transformers or tape along the way. And don't get me wrong, I'm not one of those guys that's a, a snob. Because the reality is a lot of stuff we record, we just go straight into the front of an inexpensive converter these days. Interfaces are so good now. A $300 interface now is as good as anything I was using 20 years ago that cost 15 grand. You have access to incredible stuff. Look, Christian just handed me this. I mean, this Evo 4, you can make a record on this and nobody will know that you didn't go into a studio that cost, you know, $2,000 a day. It's all about your creativity. This is super inexpensive. I think this is, what is this, $129? I don't know, we use it all the time. When we go and film, we bring one of these and we, we record straight into it. It's absolutely superb.
So let's check out the analog channel. As you can see here, it's got an input, it's got a drive, it's got an EQ curve, it's got attack and release. Here you can select different tapes, so you can have seven and a half ips, so that's basically seven and a half inches per second. It's moving slower. When it moves slower, it tends to have a bump in the low end, um, all the way up to 30 ips. 30 ips tends to have a little bit more hi-fi sound and a sweeter top end. But, you know, many of us, especially on drum mixes, will go to the 15 or the seven and a half ips to just get the extra low end. Then you can do a vintage or modern machine. Vintage would probably be sort of pre-early, mid 80s. Could be, um, and you can do an American machine, you know, like an Ampex, um, or, you could do, or, or you can do like an MCI, or you can do, of course, the Swiss machines, like Studer's, which were incredible. I have one. You can, do all kinds of wonderful things. It is really, really good for taking digital sounds, taking generic sounds, and just giving them a little bit of pizzazz. I think they're. I think it's a subtle miracle worker, to be honest. I'm just going to listen to this guitar for a second. It's a good example. So this guitar actually works in the mix. If I've thrown in the mix. It's good, but it's a little spiky. It's a little spiky. Have a listen again. I used the analog delay on it. I used the Carl Martin echo tone. So you can hear the delay is nice and dark. It's wonderful. That's great but the guitar sound itself is a little abrasive, a little bright. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna grab the analog channel. Okay, so this, this is not the basic one, there's the 101, this is the 202. So give it a listen. That's a good place to, for us to highlight that clang. I mean, you can hear it giving, uh, people hate this and it's probably, there's a good reason, tape compression, people hate that. But what they mean is the transient gets rounded off. It's not compressor, it's not a compressor, but it's rounding off those transients really nicely. So we can play with the bias control, like so. We can play with the bump in the low end, you see here. So we can fatten it up if we want. It's also got a roll off here. So we can take away excessive low end. We've got Swiss, which of course would be a Studer. We've got Japanese. You see it says O, oh, that would be like an Otari. Um, I used to have one of those too. Uh, USA would be MTR. Look at, the, look at the EQ curve on an MTR. And then of course USA A would be Ampex. So I can adjust the bump here. I can really exaggerate it, for instance. Um, so let's let's have some fun with it. So I'm going to go USA Ampex. I'm going to go seven and a half ips, and I'm going to go vintage, which is already in. And then there's like an EQ type setting here, and then I can I can abuse it by hitting it harder. Okay, so I went pretty aggressive on it. So what I've done is I've, I've taken the bias over to the right. It's a little darker. I went, actually ended up with the MTR. It's on seven and a half ips. And I went to this, um, this second EQ setting and it's on vintage. So here's a before. Here's an after.
really hitting it hard in the way and I'm going to bring that down. I love it. It's fairly subtle by modern plugins, but you're talking about using this on a lot of channels. The thing about the analog channel, I could have a quick look at the uh, CPU up here. So here's the system usage here. That's all the plugins on the whole session. If I do, let's do. A bunch of instances of this. We're at 24 when it's playing, 27. So here is here's our CPU. Thirty-one to thirty-three. Now it's add another five instances. Seems to have gone down. <laughs> so I now have six instances on there and the CPU is, didn't change at all. So the reason why we've always loved analog channel, why a lot of you know professional mixers just kind of stick it on every other channel is because you can just subtly shape the sound. You can control some transients. You can pretend that you're using tape and I don't think it's even necessary that people are snobs about tape. It's just more about like, well, we can put it on there and just, just control some of the transits. Maybe just make it a little bit more low end in it. Give it a little bump. Use the bias control to just take off some of the high end. Use, you know, go to the seven and a half ips. It seems to just be a little, a little bit warmer down there. And before you know it, you're putting this on a lot of channels. And that's really how most people I know use the analog channel. And then they mix from there. Like, it's almost like they've just been given something just a little sweeter sounding to work with. So as you can see, we put, we've got six instances on there and it made absolutely no difference to the CPU. So you could go over and put it on every single channel and just use it just to tame some stuff and then start mixing. It's a great, great plugin. And MacDSP are just a great company to work with. So the next one is probably gonna be no surprise to you all. It's the OX Sound Soothe 2. I was not the first one on this. I've been one of the champions of it, but it is an absolutely superb plugin. I don't get any royalties for pushing this whatsoever. I don't know any of these plugins, but what I will tell you is this is a lifesaver. So there it is. It is dumb. It does the job. It's got lots of features that I've never even really delved into because it just always does the job really easily. But if I go to Lily's vocal here. I'm gonna need someone to fix my half a heart and stitch me up inside before I rip apart. I wonder where I'd be if I had you from the start. I really need someone. All that It's sounding pretty good. I've got a de-esser on it. I've got some EQ. I've got one compressor on it. It's the Arvox, which is just a great compressor. But let's grab OX Sound Soothe 2. And it defaults in a really nice area. You see, you've got like between four, eh, it's just about 5K. And it's got a very wide Q, I suppose, is what you would call it here. And what's that doing? Well, basically, those high mids where your ears are really super sensitive, it is just looking out for them. Have a listen. I'm gonna need someone to fix my half a heart and stitch me up inside before I rip apart. I wonder where I'd be if I had you from the start. I really need someone. All that it left was half a heart. Put it into the track. I might back it off slightly, but you see all of those errant kind of frequencies are just controlled in a very natural way. So I use the depth control a lot. So I haven't touched anything. This is just a default. So let's have a listen to it in the track.
Bypass, have a listen. I mean, I've got to be honest, the OX Sound Soothe 2 is basically the sound of like modern mixed music, where you have a really, really even sounding vocal that once you've done this, you could actually brighten it afterwards. You could brighten the whole vocal. So I, I'm like, okay, that sounds so much smoother, but maybe I just need it to bite a bit more. So you're probably thinking, well, why would you dull it and then brighten it? Well, what I've done is I'm sitting there and it's 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 dynamically controlling all those aggressive high mids. And now I could just get in and go, you know, let's just put it on here. It's great. So what it's doing is because it's dynamically controlling all of those rough edges, I can now boost the overall thing and make it brighter and sit in the mix without like, oh, ee, ah, ee, all these like, you know, <laughs> these daggers coming into your ears. It really is, it's an incredible plugin, but it's not just for vocals. Obviously, predominantly, it's going to be the ultimate vocal plugin. I know it's Daryl Thorpe loves it. It was Eric Valentine was the first person I saw using it. And he just went, it's a lifesaver. And I was like, okay, and I, and I take those guys seriously. Eric is one of the best mixers in the world. He's one of the best producers in the world. I love his work. So when he was using it, it turned me on to it. And that was a few years ago. And then Daryl, and I would go start going around and interviewing people and ask them their top five plugins. And it was in like 75% of the people's top five plugins. So absolutely superb plugin. Yep, use it on low end on things that you want to control with like boom, anything like mid-range, acoustic guitars that maybe you're doing that sitar thing where it's like like notes are jumping out, stick it on that and it's superb. And they're lovely people. They're just really good. Small company, they only have a couple of products and they really know what they're doing. So we're gonna do kind of an overview because pretty much everybody I know, especially mastering engineers, um, have the isotope RX, the whole suite. And you can buy everything. There's like RX 10 upgrade here, all of this kind of stuff. But so here's like everything. One of the plugins I absolutely love and use every single day, not just the RX stuff for like removing clicks. We, we did some, recently did something where I left the click in on the acoustic guitar as it faded out. And people said, why didn't you take it out? I said, I left it in on purpose to prove that I also make mistakes and have clicks loud, too loud. But we did a song the other day where we took the click out using RX. And you could just go in there and identify where the click is and then just draw it out. It is a miraculous suite of plugins. One of the things we do a lot when we do covers, we like to preserve the original groove and feel of a track. So what we can do is take the original track and then extract the drum beat from it. And then if you extract the drum beat, you can sit there and put in a tempo map and then actually cut the song again to the original feel of the track. I learned that when I was working on X Factor. They asked me to do a version of With A Little Help From My Friends, the Joe Cocker version, not the Beatles Ringo Starr version. And if you're aware of that song, the tempo changes are absolutely massive. They, they, they're like, what would you do if I sang out into and describe a little help from my friends? I mean, it's like, I can't remember, like 30, 20 difference in tempo. It's enormous. And other people had cut the track and they'd found an average and just kind of like, what would you do if I sang out of tune? What would you do if my friends? My little friend. And Simon had Coward absolutely hated all of his other versions. So I was like, well, what's magical about the Joe Cocker version? Well, obviously Joe Cocker is one of the greatest singers that ever lived. That's the number one magical thing. And the musicianship is insane. I think you all know that Jimmy Page played guitar on that quite famously, or at least rumored to play guitar on it. No, I think he did. Um, and so all of this, you know, all of these great folklore things, and I was like, well, the thing is just the, the massive tempo changes. So I took and extracted out the beat and then recut the whole song to the original groove, replayed all the drums, obviously, you know, go the more modern sounds and stuff, and then sent it into X Factor. 
And Simon loved it. He was like, you nailed it. And I didn't do anything clever. I just used the original groove of the song. So when I recut everything to it, I think it was Kurt Buscara played on it. I kept that groove. And what we're talking about is called music rebalance. So you can sit there, you can take a track and you can remove the drums, have them separated, the low end. It's difficult for guitars to have like guitars and keys all as one, but then vocals separately as well. And if you're doing covers, especially if it's your job to go out and play covers every night, you can remove the elements that you want. You can recut stuff, you can modernize it. So it just sounds a little bit more modern, especially if you take an old 50s or 60s song. Whatever you want to do, it is a miraculous plugin. But Isotope, full stop, all of their bundle is amazing. It's not cheap, but it's pretty much second to none when it comes to doing audio repair. If you're a mastering engineer, you have to have this. You have to take it seriously. It's an incredible tool to have. Isotope rule in this world. So next up is probably, you know, another old favorite, and that's sound toys. I mean, we all know the little altar boy and where you can just manipulate and just create some amazing stuff. We've done a couple of videos using it, but I've got to be honest, Echo Boy, just the good old fashioned Echo Boy is one of the best sounding delays on the market. Crystallize is absolutely incredible, of course. Um, the Devil Lock is huge on drums and stuff. If you just want like get really over the top distortion, but really adds energy into it because it's like a really extreme compressor. They have so many great things, but Sound Toys Echo Boy is ridiculous. I just feel like it's the ultimate analog sounding delays. And there's been some really great ones as well that I absolutely love, but I consistently love it. And here it is. Mix control. Let's just send a vocal to it. I'm gonna need someone to fix my half a heart and stitch you Now, obviously, I can sync it to the tempo of the song or I can tap it. I've got a groove control so I can make it swing. I can just basically make it slightly out of time so it just feels better. You can do rushing. Um, you, you basically you've got a feel here so you can push it rushing or dragging. That was actually a, that was, I'm sure you're, well, not all of you, but some, some of you will remember in the 80s, there was actually a MIDI tool called Russian, Russian and Dragon. And you could use it to delay and just make things just feel like they're slightly wrong because everything was getting so perfect in those days when people really cared about that. Now everybody seems to make everything perfect on purpose. But it's just so easy to use. Single echo, dual echo, ping pong, rhythm echo. Um, you've got saturation control up here, but then you know, input and output controls, obviously, a low cut and a high cut. So if you want to make the, the, the make it sound like a really, really cheap or a very low fi really dark or super bright echo, you can shape it really easily. Um, you've got all the different times. You've got 16th note, eighth notes, 32nd, half notes, quarter notes, whole notes, you name it. It's absolutely superb. You can just select it from here as well. But this is probably the best thing is the style of tape. So I can go through and choose all of these different ones. You've got a master tape, so it'll be like a half inch. A studio tape, probably 24 track, two inch. An Echoplex, a Space Echo, a Tube Tape, um, a Cheap Tape, which is probably like, you know, micro cassette or something like that. It, look at all of these things. Verb, splattered, diffused, ambient, queaked, Distorted, limited, distressed, fat, saturated, vibrato, a CE1 chorus, analog chorus, digital chorus, analog delay. It's crazy. Telephone, AM radio, FM. It is a simple to use. I hate saying this, but it is an industry standard. And I have sat with so many mixers that just no Echo Boy back to front can get it to sound good immediately and just bring it up. It's an old favorite, but I, it's a pretty hard to beat this company. Sound Toys, they just consistently make great plugins that are very, very usable. Now, let's get into the, the wonderful world of what everybody hates. Auto-tune. Yes. So let's type in the word auto-tune. Everybody's like, what? You're going to talk about it. I am going to talk about it because, you know, one of my best friends is uh, Jack Douglas. Absolute genius of record producer and engineer, made some of the best sounding records ever. And now he, he wasn't using auto tune in 1973 or 74 when he was making huge albums, huge albums for decades. 
Uh, but he was slowing down the tape to hit a high note. He was doing whatever you could. And then, you know, in the early 80s, late 70s, the basic samplers, they would sample in a long note and then they would play it, trigger it, and use the pitch bend wheel and put it in tune. That was famously done in the early 80s on quite a few artists where they would have the tuner in the middle, whether it be the Peterson or the Korg one or whatever was the Duragur one of that time. And they would just sit there with the pitch bend wheel and just make sure everything was in tune. It took a long time because you have to sample very short phrases in and do it. We've always cheated to a certain extent. And whether it be slowing down tape or whatever, um, I don't mind using it as long as it's not abused. Abusing these tools is where it goes all horribly wrong. The other day I showed, showed the new Waves harmonizer. And I said to everybody, I would create crazy harmonies and then I would tuck it down really super low and have it underneath to add some air and energy to the vocal. And lots of people were like, oh, you know, don't, nobody did that in the 70s. It's like, yes, they did. Yes, they did. There was a harmonizer. It was Eventide, who we will talk about in a second. Eventide made a harmonizer. And so many of our, of our favorite artists used it and would blend it in lightly. So these tools are all in like beauty in the eye of the beholder. It's how you use them. You don't have to go in there and like take everything with an inch of its life and make it absolutely perfect and grid everything and time it up so it's like, Nyeh! sounds like a robot sung it. You can use them to add some width and some depth. You could use a harmonizer to just get some energy underneath. But with auto-tune, I work only in graphical. When I've seen bad stuff done, it's because somebody got in there and just straight lined it. They either used it on auto, so it just went up to the note and hit it, or they drew in straight lines. I never do that. Never, ever do that. Let's have a quick look at a vocal here. Now there's loads of part, there's like, there's drop-offs, there's all kinds of stuff. There's nothing to that I want to chew. But I'm gonna open it up and just show you. I'll go to an audio suite and we'll talk quickly about what's good and bad and how to avoid being bad. So I'm opening the Auto-Tune Pro. Now this, if you're ever gonna use it, this is the only way I suggest using it. First of all, you know, know the key of the song. If you're not musical, find out the key of the song so you have a guide of what notes to get. What I do, is I go, first of all, you've got classic and all this kind of stuff. Um, I love that control, you know, but this is what I do. I'm gonna to go to the graphical mode and I am just gonna hit track. I can do pitch and time. So I can do pitch and time. I don't really need to, um, to move things in time, but if you had to like take a phrase, you could actually nudge it around. Okay, so we're gonna render it. So it's now grabbed it. I'm gonna go in there. And, you know, it's a human being singing. She's slightly out of tune here. But you see, it's all going around the note. The only thing that looks even remotely like it's hitting a note perfectly is that little tiny phrase there. She's like going almost too perfectly in tune in that point. But there's nothing about this that I want to change. For for a whip, for a... So if I wanted to hit that F for a... and take it down. I don't want to, but if I wanted to, what I could do is I could just go to this little area here and it's just say... Mm -mm -mm. I can do make curves, and what it does is it just draws in what's already there, but I don't want to touch anything. So I'm just gonna do this. I'm gonna draw right across this, dang and then, and just cut. So now I just cut it. In fact, now I'm gonna go here and just draw this down here. You can cut this, literally use the, the cutting tool. I've just, I've been doing this for years, so I just do my thing that I do. Okay, so now what I can do is I can just grab, and if I can grab this whole piece, and just pull it down towards the note like that. I preserved all of the movement in the vocal where she went, whatever. I haven't touched any of that. I've just nudged it towards it. If you want to use auto-tune, do things like that. Just find things and just nudge it towards it. 
Don't do what everybody does and draw a straight line across that, because you'll be like, and before you know it, it sounds like really bad early 2000s emo music, where everything is auto-tuned. I never... <laughs> Sorry, I was just like, God. Yeah, you don't want that. So that's all I did. Just that little tiny part. So I can process it. Obviously, I don't need any of this stuff here. I can just go back to the original. But let's have a listen. For a rip apart. It just goes F, G, A, for a, for a. It's just closer to the F. For a rip apart. It doesn't go. Doo, doo, beep, doo, doo. It just preserved all of the inflection in her voice. If you are going to use auto tune, that's how you use it. Just do the minimal amount. Just tug it towards the note so it sounds like a human being sung it. Because you know what? If I'd done three more takes, she probably would have done that. I didn't. I should have done another take to get that little thing. But of that whole phrase, that's the only thing I needed to correct. For a rip apart, how I knew where I'd be. For a rip apart. I mean, there's so much where she's tailing up and down the note. She's going, like, putting a little bit extra vibrato, and then other times she's not. But that's a human being singing, and it doesn't sound out of tune. All I did was do that little tiny piece. So again, like beauty, it's in the eye of the beholder. If you've got these tools, just use them sparingly and understand how to use them well, rather than just drawing in straight lines. Oh, I can hear it. It's horrible when I hear all that stuff. Now, don't get me wrong. I do a lot of tuning on my vocal because I'm a dreadful singer. So Melodyne, of course, is another competitor to auto-tune. And when it first came out, I noticed a lot of um, non-musician engineers loved it. Because if you look at the display, for instance, it's really, really straightforward. You know, because you can, you can just literally draw a block like this, and then if you want to change it, you can just drag the whole note and put it to the note you want it to be. It's really quick and easy to use. And one of the things I really enjoyed about using it, and when we do use Melodyne, is we use it for two purposes. We use it for extracting MIDI. It is superb. I don't know if there's a better software for extracting MIDI. Now, I know many of you use Ableton and other devices which have, I think Cubase has that in, so many devices, but Melodyne's software for extracting MIDI information is superb. It's really, really good at it. So I like it for that. But I also like it when I want to build a harmony manually. I'll load in a lead vocal and then I'll mess around and manually do it because it's got such an easy graph to use. I can do it in auto-tune as well. But for years, before we had all these fancy plugins that would automatically build the harmonies, I would just sit there and move it around. So for a, a graphic, the way it's laid out, it's absolutely superb. So we just got a couple more to talk about. We just talked about Eventide a second ago. They have a handful of plugins which are absolutely superb. My good friends, New York-based friends like Jack, of course, and Shelley and Jay Messina, they all grew up making records as Eventide were inventing these pieces of hardware which revolutionized our business. And of course, the H910, the H3000, which I have one, I have an H7000, are some of the best pieces of hardware ever made. People use them for sound design, for rock and roll, you name it. They also do guitar pedals. Look at all this stuff here. It's insane what they do. They are a wonderful, wonderful company. Um, yeah, their legacy is incredible. But look, this, for instance, the H949 harmonizer plugin is, it's the sound of 70s vocals. What Jack and guys like that used to do was actually set it so it's like moving, flicking slightly in and out of tune, and then just blend that below the vocal. And it wasn't like a full-blown chorus, it just thickened the vocal ever so slightly. The H949 is amazing. Their instant flanger is still probably one of the best sounding flangers ever made. It is a sound that you will recognize instantly. If you want to listen to classic 70s records, early 80s, and you want to hear a flange on a whole mix, I guarantee it was an instant flanger. Jack also used to use it on the bottom of a snare, and he would set it, set it to go choo, choo, so it would detune. So every time he'd like hear, poof, 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 you hear this, choo, 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 and it just makes the snare sound thicker. Really, really great stuff. But I will have to say that their new plugin, new-ish, I think it came out in the last year or so, the Split 
Oh, and by the way, the instant phaser. Unbelievable. Bob Clear Mountain, you know, Bob Clear Mountain used these on everything. The instant phaser was an incredible plugin. But getting back to the point, it's the split EQ. This is an absolutely superb plugin. I love these speakers. This room sounds so good. So here's the split EQ. It is a, what do they call it? They call it transient tonal. Basically, it is, lots of people have done this, but I think most people that have reviewed this, and we did do a review of it, think they, they pretty much perfected it. You can sit there and go. So I can take an EQ and boost it. Of course I can. So I've got, I've got a frequency selection, I've got a gain, I've got a cue, all of those things. So what I did is I played with the decay time and I took this transient separation, put the decay time down, and now I'm getting more da 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 I'm getting it to be a little funkier. Da da da. So it's becoming like dead string and funkier. Now if I break that decay out all the way up. See all that funk dead string? It's just so good. So you can take this guitar part here and introduce the funk back in. Before, after. It's brilliant, absolutely brilliant. And I know other people have done the versions of this um, when we reviewed it, lots of people, but I, I don't know. This is one of the simplest to use, really, really straightforward. I can just go and take that and go, I need more percussion. Oh, you know, do we go out there? Do I go and do a tambourine part? Do I put a shaker in there? Do I, sometimes like, like the edge, I'll do dead strings. Chica, 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 chica. I just gave it dead string movement without playing another guitar because it's in all of those guitars. Dun, 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 dun. I exaggerated it. I soloed it. I got to hear the frequency. I knew I wanted it to be mid-range. I wanted it to be because I just wanted that to cut through. It's a really brilliant, brilliant plugin. It's really good on things like kick drums as well because you can go into a kick drum where you may have a little bit of resonation going on, like but you want to bring up so you can go in there and focus on just that low end and boost it and then shorten the decay. Instead of getting you get the do, do, do. Absolutely superb plugin. And of all the newer plugins, well, this and Soothe too, just head and tails, one of the best plugins that's come out in the last couple of years. All right, last but no means least, we can't forget uh, the great Slate plugins. And so Slate has um, a de that Soothe is doing all this incredible stuff, but their de is really, really superb. We're not going to forget our good friends at Slate. The thing about Stephen's company is, you know his philosophy, and I completely and utterly agree with it. He wants people to be making music. It was one of the things when I first started YouTube, I really liked Graham Cochran. He had this um, YouTube channel called Recording Revolution. 
And it wasn't teaching like the most complicated techniques of how to do this, but it was teaching like really good, smart, everyday stuff that got people started making music. And he did really, really well. And he was a great guy and he gave away a lot of, a lot of free information. There's a similar philosophy with Stephen, where, and it completely resonates with me, he wants to make great sounding equipment at affordable prices. And if you get the Slate bundle, I don't know what it is now. I mean, it looks like the preamp collection is 149, but you can do a monthly, you can do all kinds of stuff. And in that Slate bundle, I mean, look at that, the virtual mix rack, $149 or $4 a month if you buy it. For, I mean, the point is, is it's all affordable. It's not just one plugin that's $149. It's a whole suite of plugins. And we really, really like his DSA. I like a lot of his plugins, but his DSA, here it is. It's the EOSIS, I think is how you pronounce it, or IOSIS, depending on where you're from. Um, and I'm gonna take off Soothe here, and I'm just gonna let you hear it with, it, with and without. I really need someone, all that he left was half a heart. All right, so Lily here's got a couple of S's. All that he left was half a heart. So, uh, so, here we go, let's listen to that line. All that he left was half a heart. 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 I mean, first of all, it. It shows you where where those two S's, I said a couple of S's, and lo and behold, two, two nice orange areas come up and say, yes, there they are. I mean, I mean, anything that is dumb and does it for me, I'm not going to have a problem with. All that he left was half a heart. All that he left was half a heart. I mean, I don't have to touch anything. It worked. Um, so let's put it in the track. I mean, anything that defaults and sounds good is fine by my book. Now, obviously, we can get in there. We can tweak it. We don't need to because it's a, it's a well-designed plugin and the defaults are really good. There is going to be times you have to be more aggressive with it or vice versa. You're going to have to turn it down because it might be, you know, grabbing something a little bit more than you want. I know when I did, um, when I've worked with Latin artists, I worked with Christian uh, Castro and his label said, you've de-essed it too much. And because... You know, he was singing in Spanish. There's a lot of, sh -sh -sh -sh. and I being, you know, English guy was like, oh, there's too many S's. I have to bring them all down. And they're like, no, he sounds like he's lisping now. So, you know, we've all done it. So I would back off a lot of what I would be doing here. But with most American voices or British voices or pretty much anybody that's singing in English, I should say, anyways, you want to control those S's. Um, and it's a superb sounding, great, great plugin. Straight away, it sounds good. I can adjust, um, you know, I got a smooth control here. All that he left was half a heart. All that he left was half a heart. Dry, dry, wet, so I go full wet. All that he left was half a heart. All that he left was half a heart. So check out all the Slate plugins. Every manufacturer we've talked about here has a really great set of plugins. These, to me, are the ones that I continually come back to. I feel like the on this one in particular, it worked really nicely on acoustic guitars as well. So if you get it as part of the bundle, it's not Soothe too, but it does a lot of what that does. So if you can't afford to buy at this stage the beautiful Soothe 2 plugin, get the Slate bundle with this included. It's all about having the tools that will do the job that you can afford to use. You don't want to get yourself into a situation where you've spent like $3,000 on plugins and that's your month's rent, that's the food, that's your cell phone, that's your gas bill, that's everything. You know, get out there making music. There's so many great stock plugins that can do really, really great stuff and just augmenting, cherry picking some of these because like I said, I've been using the analog channel since 99, 2000, whenever it came out, that's 22 years. I've been using MV2 since that came out, Arbe since it came out. And then I've been finding like these newer plugins like Soothe 2, obviously this plugin here, the, the Slate stuff. These are all newer plugins I've added to my arsenal. But it's a lot of acquired knowledge. You don't necessarily have to go out and spend thousands of dollars immediately, but cherry pick these kinds of things and find the plugins that, you know, solve problems or 
help your mixing now where you're at. And as your ears develop, you'll buy more things that make sense to you. And I like to review things and find out what they're good for. That's really important to me because there's lots of plugins out there that may only have one or two jobs. But if you've got something that maybe can cover like 50 jobs at a certain bargain price, then go for it. What do you use? Let us know down below. We'd love to know. What are your favorite plugins? These are the plugins I use every single day. What are the plugins that you use every single day? Thanks ever so much for watching. So long, farewell, au revoir, adios, tuzines, ciao, goodbye.